Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Carrie Damon. I'm Director of Entrepreneurship Education here at Mars. And uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to um, a Mars Best Practice series. Um, I see a lot of familiar faces in the audience, so I'm supposed to actually introduce Charles Plant, our speaker today, but I'm sure a lot of you know him quite well. Um, I will give you a couple um, things about his sort of background. I actually met Charles, he was my accounting professor in, um, when I did my MBA at Schulich. And coming from an English lit background, um, accounting was not something I was really looking forward to. But he taught it in such an interesting way. He really made it about um, using numbers to, to make strategic decisions, which was a language I, could, I, I spoke. So I, you know, he, he likes to make jokes about how, you know, he's not proud that he's an accountant, but he really has a, a unique ability to explain really important things in a way that people who are not um, knee deep in having done a, a, you know, a chartered accountancy um, <clears throat> program can understand. So he is very proud, however, of being an entrepreneur. And he has, um, he started his own company, a software company called Synamics. It was a telecommunications software firm. Um, he's worked as a CEO or CFO for several successful software companies. And um, since his time of being an entrepreneur, he's also worked as a management consultant, an investment banker, um, an auditor, and with close to over 100 companies. He is currently the CFO of, at Mars. Um, he's had a number of positions at Mars, one of which was the managing director of the Business Mentorship and Entrepreneurship Program, which was a program he built, which um, connects Mars around the province with, through entrepreneurs and residents and providing market intelligence for um, entrepreneurs. So it is my pleasure to welcome Charles Plant um, to give a, a great presentation on the art of realistic forecasting. Thanks, Carrie. And uh, Carrie was one of my best students ever. I don't know how she managed that, but for some reason it's because she could write where all the other people in the class couldn't write. I'll warn you, first thing is this session is worth exactly what you're paying for it. Now, I know Michael has actually paid money for this. Oh, sorry about that, Michael. He's the only one in the audience. And at, at the back, there are pencils, sharpened pencils for people who want to stab their eyes out in boredom. Uh, so you can uh, feel relieved that you have a chance of staying awake. So, has anybody here produced forecasts before? Successfully. No, not successfully. <laughs> we would have far fewer hands up for successful. So there are a lot of you who have produced forecasts. What do you feel about them? They're a joke? Sorry? Haphazard? Only as good as the information you put in. Exactly. You know, it has been one of my biggest challenges over many, many years to produce realistic forecasts. And I have done it wrong so many times that you can't believe it. So a lot of what we're going to talk about today is based on personal experience of doing it wrong and then figuring out later, oh my god, what did I do? How do I do it right? Etc. So. The first thing we start with is, what is a hockey stick forecast? And that's exactly what they look like. I've seen so many business plans over the years that have the most amazing projections for revenue. They're phantasmagorical. In fact, someone took that word and not believing it was a word thought I invented it because I continually meet entrepreneurs and say, oh my god, your forecasts are phantasmagorical. They're not, you mean, that just can't exist. And that's what they look like. They look like this year is flat, but next year, my God, sort of like the Hudson's Bay's forecast for the last 20 years or so. You see them in the paper all the time. You know, last year was a bad year, but next year is going to be phenomenal. The first forecast I ever did was uh, almost 30 years ago. And I did it because there were townhouses selling in Barrie for $32,000. And you could put $1,000 down on a townhouse and rent it out and actually have positive cash flow. So I scratched my head and said, you know, it's probably likely that real estate will increase in value over time. So I sat down with masses of graph paper that I had scotch taped together, because if you remember 30 years ago, there was not, you know, personal computers hardly existed. I had a trash 80 Model 1 with 16K of uh, memory and a tape drive. Produced this forecast, and I went, oh my god, look at this. 
if this happens and this happens, you know, I should buy 10 of these townhouses because $10,000 down isn't a lot of money. Ten, buy 10 townhouses, rent them out, and in 20 years I can retire. So I took the forecast to a bunch of friends who laughed at them and said, oh, you know, this is just hockey stick forecasts. There's nothing like that going to happen. Now, unfortunately, I listened to my friends and did not invest in 10 townhouses in Barrie. Because if I had invested in those 10 townhouses in Barrie, can you imagine what sort of money that is? They're about 250,000 today. That, oddly enough, was my very first forecast and the only accurate one that I've ever done in my life. <laughs> Everything since then has been downhill. So, has anybody here produced hockey stick forecasts? Yeah, you know what they look like, you know how they feel. What you might not know is what the problem with them is. Now, the first thing that can happen, and you know, this has happened to me umpteen times, is that you produce a hockey stick forecast, and what's going to happen with it? You're going to give it to someone else, right? You're going to give it to them and say, this is what we're going to do. Well, what happens when you don't do that? What happens when you don't meet your forecasts? Well, they're going to think you're an idiot. So there are hundreds of people around the world who think I'm an idiot because I've produced consistently hockey stick forecasts that come out with great rosy projections and that fail to reach realization. The problem is when you've got people believing it and they actually invest in you, then they're going to say, okay, well, you know, your forecasts say you need five million dollars, so here's five million dollars. What's the next thing that happens? Well, you don't reach your forecasts, you run out of money, and you're sitting there with no money in the bank. So if these are venture capitalists, what's the first thing they do? Well, they're going to put more money into the company, but they're going to put it in at a lower price than they put it in last time, a so-called down round. So the first effect of failing to meet your forecasts is that you're going to end up with some sort of negative event for your company. You're either going to go out of business because you've raised only enough money to reach your forecasts, or you're going to get somebody else investing and it's going to be a down round. On the other hand, if you knew what your revenue was going to be for the next two years, do you think you could be profitable? Do you think that might be at all possible? If you look at Boeing and the big airline manufacturers, how much visibility do they have on future revenue? Five years. I mean, the process of getting a plane built is a long time. So they know what their revenue is going to be for the next five years. You wonder why some of these larger companies are profitable, why some of the banks are profitable. They know pretty well what their revenue is going to be. And because they know what their revenue is going to be, they're able to become profitable. So on the one hand, if you don't know what your revenue is going to be, you're going to be in severe difficulty. If you do know, you can actually produce consistent profits. And I played and I played and I experimented and, and Kerry mentioned Cynamics. Well, I played with it so much that I finally got good at forecasting revenue. Now that was in a company that had existing customers. For the last five years of running that company, we produced consistent growth and consistent profit. Year over year, 30% growth and consistent profitability every single year. And the trick was knowing your forecast knowing and understanding what the results were going to be and releasing funds and tightening up in funds because you know exactly what's going to happen. So the key is how to be able to do that. But let's first look at the reality of results. And this is what people tend not to look at when they're building a company is that they aren't referring to other people who have built companies to say, you know, what have other people done and what can I do in comparison to them? So typical forecasts. And from time to time, I do these nerdy things like economic studies and things like that just to figure out what's going on. So at one point in time, I looked at 35 different startup software companies. And I'm hoping to do that sometime with the Investment Accelerator Fund, which is at Mars, to go back and say, what are these people projecting as their revenue and what sort of results are they getting? So I looked at 35 startups. The average first year growth budgeted was 402%. The average second year growth budgeted was 246%. Sound like reasonable numbers? Let's take a look at RIM. RIM is a great company. We all agreed? Phenomenal success. What you probably many of you don't know is that RIM was started in 1982, and it wasn't until 1997 that they actually started to produce results. 
And even in the years, they sort of muddled around and around the $2 million revenue range for about 15 years and all of a sudden took off. But when they started taking off, there was only one year in which RIM got more than 100% growth. Now they did something like 250% growth in that year. Open Text is another case in point, another great Canadian company. Only one year in their history have they been able to produce growth of greater than 100%. Now, the great thing about open text and RIM is in all those other years when they didn't have 100% growth, they're operating at 75% growth. Now, if you start compounding 75% growth year after year for 10 years, you've got a hell of a good sized company at the end of that time period. So the trick is, don't hold your expectations so, so highly. If you look at what actual results occur in the marketplace, Branham.ca is a great source of information because it shows all of the various different technology companies in the country, divides them into groups, and you can actually go into past years and trace back through the last five years to figure out how fast are companies able to grow. And in Canada, the smallest in the Branham list in this time period I was looking at it had revenue of about $2 million. Now, the actual average growth rate of all of the technology companies on that list, and there were 100 companies when I was looking at this, was 24%. Now that's really good growth, actually. You say, okay, the top ones grow a bit smaller, a bit less than the bottom ones. Well, the bottom quartile of those companies, the ones that are two to $10 million, were growing at 40% a year. So in actual results, 40% a year is what people are able to do. Now, why do you think that might be the case? It's hard to hire people. It's hard to get people on board and to get people up to stream to create the consistent growth levels. So no matter what you might think, oh sure, we can technically grow at 300% a year, it's unlikely to happen because you can't get people on board fast enough to be able to keep that growth going. There's a real difference between the US and Canada. And it's a fundamental problem that we've got in Canada in that if you look at the successful companies in Canada, it's taking them about 10 years to reach $10 million. So once again, you're thinking, well, you know, I've seen forecasts that do $10 million easily in three years. But in actual fact, 10 years in Canada, six years in the States. One of the reasons they're able to grow faster is they get larger rounds of VC capital and most of the extra money, it costs the same amount to pretty well to develop a product in the US as it does in Canada, but they have way more money for marketing. Typical spend in investment capital for a company that gets to $10 million is $18 million of capital. So it takes $18 million of, dollars of capital to get to 10 million in six years. And the great thing about these American companies, in 10 years, the successful ones are reaching 50 million. And that's the difference between the two technology communities. In Canada, in 10 years, we reach 10. In the US, in 10 years, they're reaching $50 million. This is a great graph, and you can find it in various places. There's an old blog that I wrote on the Mars site that has this in it. This is showing the best companies ever. These are the best companies in the US market and their rates of growth. And you can see the line at which they made 50 million. You'll see there are, there are quite a few, the ones in red, are reaching 50 million in six years. The ones in orange are reaching it in 10, and all sorts of other ones, and these are the best 50 companies in the United States, are taking 13 years or so to reach $50 million. So their ramp and their growth is a lot slower than people might expect. The reference is made to something called a rocket ship. And a rocket ship is a company that reaches $50 million annually in six years or less. Most successful technology companies aren't rocket ships. Most of them have good, consistent growth, but they don't get to $50 million in six years. Only 28% of the most successful companies were rocket ships. The most successful, this is the 50 most successful, only 28% of them got to $50 million in six years. A hot shot reaches $50 million in seven to 22 years, or seven to 12 years. A slow burner, now, slow burner, we're talking derogatory terms about, let's say, 30 of the top 50 software companies in the United States. The slow burners are taking 13 years or more to get to $50 million. So if you go back to what happens if you predict too fast growth, 
you're going to run out of your money soon, you're going to have to raise it more in a down round, or you're going to just go out of business. And time after time after time, Canadian companies are going out of business because they're thinking they can grow too fast, they aren't able to produce the results, and nobody believes them anymore. The key is, in your forecasts, don't try and outdo Google. I have literally seen plans that say we are going to be bigger than Google. Written in their financial forecasts, we are going to be bigger than Google. Companies expect somehow that what they're doing is miraculous enough that they can be bigger than Google. The first key to success is have realistic expectations. Don't try and outdo Google. In fact, don't try and outdo the 50 most successful software companies that have ever existed or 50 most successful life sciences companies. Try to be amongst the very successful ones that might reach $10 million in six, seven, eight, nine, or 10 years. If you do that, you have effectively a winner in Canada. So there are two ways to produce forecasts. We wanted to get into this, and I'll get into a little some of the stupid mistakes I've made, because this is as a result of the stupid mistakes. Two ways of doing them are top-down forecasts and bottom-up forecasts. Make sense? Very simple. So before you start, before you start doing your forecast, there's some things you must know. You've got to know your target market, your business model, and your go-to-market strategy. Without those things, you can't produce a forecast. You're just playing with numbers in Excel. And playing with numbers in Excel is really fun. I agree. It's just, OK, some of you might not agree with that. I understand. But it, it, it really is a lot more fun than doing it on paper with a pencil. So you have to understand the marketing background of what you're doing, the, the key drivers of your market in order to be successful. So the first thing you've, you've got to say is, how big is the market? Anybody here read Gartner, Forrester, Frost and Sullivan? Who's, who, who's looked at those reports? What do they all say? The market's $30 billion, correct? And what's the normal entrepreneur say to the market is $30 billion? You're going to get 2%, exactly. That is, I have seen that in so many pitch decks presented to IEF, presented to all sorts of other companies. And it's a very nice thing to say, but that's not how markets work. First of all, what, what Gartner and Frost and Sullivan and Foresters is telling you is not what you're going to do. It's what the compilation of all sorts of different people in all sorts of different markets is doing when they're doing all sorts of different things. So it doesn't really address what your market is. So if you ever go before a VC and say, you know, the market's $30 billion, I'm going to get 2%, well, shame on you. But you're with a very large crowd. Uh, this is one mistake I've never made. And one of the reasons I wasn't able to make that mistake is that I could never afford to get the reports from Gartner and Frost and Sullivan. <laughs> now, that being one of the problems I had as an entrepreneur, we rectified that by starting market intelligence at Mars. And market intelligence provides those reports to people. So now they can say, oh, the market's $30 billion. I'm going to get 2%. So I've sort of fostered a bit of this problem. Wrong. Don't do that. What you have to start first is, understanding who are your potential users. Remember I said, you know, there's a bit of marketing you have to know before you start going? You have to understand who is going to be using your product. So another mistake people make is they say, well, for instance, you're targeting the medical and uh, diagnostic laboratory market, which I've put up here. Can anybody see the numbers? They're visible enough? Well, if you look at the number of firms in the medical and diagnostic laboratories market, there are about 7,800 firms in that marketplace. So people who are actually sort of one step beyond the Gartner method of forecasting, say, well, you know, there's 7,800 firms. I'm going to get 40% of those firms, and uh, my results are going to be as follows. But what they don't realize is that when you look at any of the stats on markets, they break down very quickly into the small ones, of which of that 7,800, there are 7,300 that are too small to bother with if you've got an expensive product. So in actual fact, if you have an expensive product that's going into the medical and diagnostic laboratory market, there are only about five, 600 companies that you're going to want to target. Now, I made this mistake radically at one firm. The firm is, uh, the firm's name is Opalis. It has since been sold to Microsoft, I believe. And they were producing middleware that got used in, um, in tracking all sorts of things and making decisions within systems in a large company. And so we looked at the target market, and we said, oh, geez, look at all these companies that there are. 
And then we even were half smart and said, yeah, but we're going to forget the small ones. What we didn't realize is that our target market was companies that had more than 100 servers. So if you can imagine, how many companies are there that have more than 100 servers in a company? It's a very small market. So when you actually built, dropped the numbers down to the right category, we were, we were anticipating getting way more clients than there were clients to get because we didn't understand our market. So the first thing you've got to know is how big is the market? And there's all sorts of stats out of the US that's free that'll actually tell you by company size, in number of employees or in number of institutions, things like that, how big your market is. Now in this case, what is good about this market is that while there are very few, there are about 600 of them, they happen to have about 4,300 of the 12,000 establishments. So if you're selling to each location in a medical or diagnostic laboratory, you have an opportunity to go after 4,300 of those that have more than 100 people in total in the company. So the, the understanding of the nuances of the market that you're in is essential to be able to start first with how big is the market. The second thing you've got to do is understand the rate of adoption. And uh, the rate of adoption is a, a very interesting thing because you, everybody's seen this curve before, I presume. You know, we've got innovators, we've got early adopters, early majority laggards, etc. And 2.5% are innovators. Well. What people don't realize is what that rate of adoption is. How many years is it going to take to get from zero to full adoption? Another classic error that I made, we produced the world's first soft switch. And those of you who are in telecom, you know what soft switches are like nowadays. They're, they're, they're prevalent. I mean, we're using them at Mars. Everybody's switching over to soft switches. The market for soft switches, we started and produced the first working and installed and customer using soft switches in the world uh, and we went out looking for more customers for this because we, we had a customer and we'd done it and we went looking for more. Couldn't find anybody. The next year, couldn't find anybody. Scratched our heads going, what on earth's going on? Why can't we find any customers for this? There, there, there must be something wrong. I finally went to a convention and realized that uh, it was the first convention of its type in the world on the issue of saw switches. We'd been two or three years ahead of the market. We had the faintest idea that we were so far ahead of the market that, that we were too early. So what you don't understand is how long does it take the average innovation to reach fruition in the marketplace? What's your guess? Five years? Anybody else? Classically speaking, it's 30 years. The average innovation takes 30 years to reach full fruition in the marketplace. And you can start looking. Look at cell phones. When did cell phones first come out? 1980s, so cell phones have been around for 25 years at least, and this market is still growing dramatically for cell phones. People misestimate this. When was the fax machine invented? In the US Civil War. Fax machine was invented in the US Civil War. It, so in many cases, lots of things take longer than 30 years. You look at Google and all search technology and things like that. A lot of things have had much faster ramps Facebook is at a much faster ramp than one would think. But for the most part, most technological innovations take 30 years to get into the marketplace. So if you look at the total market size, what you've got to know is that things start taking off at a certain point in time. Diffusion starts to take off somewhere in the end of the you know, opinion leaders towards the early majority. And it's a very flat curve before then. If you don't understand where you are on the curve and how long that curve is going to be, you're going to have a whole bunch of trouble in getting into that market. And you're going to expect the market to grow radically when it's not ready to do that yet. Well, that's a good slide. The next thing you've got to know is your market share. It's hard to see there. That, that's an example. Google's got 67%. Yahoo's got 20%. Most people look at market share and, you know, how do you figure out? So we, we figured out how big the market's going to be. We figured out the rate of diffusion of that innovation. Now you've got to figure out what share you're going to get. A lot of mistakes made by people in this. People think, okay, I've got the greatest thing since sliced bread. Very few markets have the leading player over 50% of the marketplace. The leader is usually sitting around 40%, and it starts cascading very quickly down from that number. The problem is 
that to get to be the leader, you have to have more bucks than anybody else. So one way of figuring out is, if you're entering a market, there are probably two or three other companies at the very nation stage entering that market. And if you go and look at how much money they raise versus how much money you have, you can probably figure out how much share of market. If they're in the US, they're raising $10 million in their first couple of rounds. If you're in Canada, you're raising $3 million in the first couple of rounds. If it costs $2 million to develop the uh, technology, then you've got a million to spend on marketing, and they've got eight million to spend on marketing. They're going to have eight times the market reach that you have. So a quick way of getting market share is share of investor dollar. And what you take with these three things is now, is this the first time I've used Excel? Did you expect I'd use Excel the whole time here? We now can look and say, OK, we have potentially 5,700 establishments that can use our technology. We could potentially sell a quarter of a million dollars a year to those establishments. And it's going to take 20 years to reach fruition in the marketplace. Our market share, we've made an estimate of 18%. So if you look at the ramp based on a 20-year um, growth in a market, so maybe 10 years to reach 50% of the market, you can see that revenue is going to build very slowly initially. 260,000 to 650 to 1.3 million to 2.6, finally getting up to five. Miraculously, in six years, it hits $10 million, doesn't it? Which is what the successful companies in the US hit. In 10 years, we're up at 130. So this is, a, this is I've just done a hockey stick forecast, by the way. I just downloaded it to the, to the back end years. We've hardly done any math so far. We've hardly used Excel. What we've had to do is understand our market thoroughly to be able to know what the market's going to buy, how many they're going to buy, when they're going to buy, and all of that information to be able to say from a top-down approach, how big is the market going to get, and what are my revenue forecasts going to look like? Next is bottom-up forecasts. And bottom-up forecasts are another great way of making mistakes. But the great thing is if you're using a number of different ways at coming at this problem, you might have some potential of, of uh, getting a correct answer. So the greatest thing I see when I see forecasts is what I call the revenue plug, where somebody sits down with Excel. Oh, I'm getting nods in the back here already. Um, when somebody sits down with Excel and says, OK, well, the first month is going to be 100,000 and the second month's going to be 150,000, then it's going to be 300,000, and then 600,000, and my first year is going to be $6.2 million. What have they done? All they've done is plug in revenue. They haven't done any analysis to say, what's it going to take to get to that revenue? What's it going to take to get to the first, that's for me. What's it going to take to get to the first 100,000? All they've done is plug revenue in. I would say 80% of the forecasts that we see have revenue plugs in them. Just a placeholder more than anything else. And of course, if you've got a placeholder that says 100,000, what are you going to spend? You know, 100,000, of course. Now, when it comes time to it, you're going to spend the 100,000. You're not going to get the 100,000. So this is the wrong forecast. So bottom up, what you want to do is understand your sales funnel. Now, understanding your sales funnel is very difficult if you're a startup company. And this is where you've got to understand the market again. You really have to understand how you're going to get and what the process is going to be to get you from where you are now to having a sale. And so people talk about sales funnel, and you can divide a sales funnel into a number of parts. Typically, and this is business to business, but it might also be business to consumer in some cases, you start with a lead. And a lead might come out of a trade show. It might come out of a response to an advertisement. It might come on anything. All you know when you have a lead is that there's a warm body out there who has some peripheral interest in what you're talking about. That's all you know. You can social marketing, whatever it is, you're going to create a lead. What you have to do with that lead is you have to engage the lead in some form of discussion to understand what the lead needs, to understand how your solution might meet the needs of that lead. And if you get to the point in time where you understand what the lead is looking for, you move on to the proposal, where you try to say, this is how we can benefit you. This is our value proposition. This is what you get out of us. And this is what we want from you in return. Simple proposal. From a proposal, you typically go through some stages of evaluation, where you know maybe the company is looking for multiple proposals. Maybe they are 
are trialing your software, they're, they're, they're looking at testimonials, reference accounts, things like that. And they move from that, if you're successful, into a trial. They might say, okay, you know, our fictional quarter of a million dollar per year thing, they might say, okay, give me 10,000 bucks worth of that, let me try it out in a controlled situation to see if it actually delivers the value proposition that you say it's going to deliver. If your trial is successful, it moves to an order. And if your order is successful and you actually manage to produce what you say you're going to produce and you're not selling vaporware, which is uh, Microsoft's habit, you move to an install. So that whole process is a sales funnel. And in order to understand your market, you have to understand all the varieties of things that can happen in that sales funnel. Now, you know, at Synamics, we were able to produce realistic forecasts because by the time we did that, we understood our sales funnel. We understood exactly who was in each stage of the sales funnel, what we had to do with them, and how to do it. Very difficult before you've started a company. Very difficult before you've made the first sale to understand what the stages are, how they work, etc. So you move to, how do you get leads? Well, you're going to go out to the marketplace and you're going to engage in some marketing type of activity that is going to drive, drive leads into the company. So far so good? So, you next have to understand how long it takes for somebody to go from a lead down to the final point where you're actually installing whatever you're installing. Has anybody here bought on behalf of a company? Made purchases? How long does it take from the first time you're aware of something to the time you actually buy? Depends on the dollar amount. That's a good point. What else? What are some examples? Just through an authorization process, even after you've made your mind up, it takes two or three months. So in understanding your market, and we keep coming back to this, you have to understand your market's behavior, the buyer behavior, industrial buyer behavior in that specific market. And they're different in all different types of markets. In the telecom market, for instance, no risk is too small to avoid. Telecom market, the average sale time in our experience at Synamics was 18 months from the time we first met the client to the time we actually had an installation. And if you look down, you can break down your sales funnel into those various components. In some things, if it's a modified rebuy situation where you're replacing an existing supplier, you might be able to get it down to three months. In other cases, if it's Boeing, for instance, how long is Boeing's lead time from initial interest to install? Um, seven years or something like that? So depending upon the nature of your market, you have a different length of time for each of the stages. But the stages exist even in consumer markets. Um, so if you start with a lead, and it's the first thing that happens, it might take a month to get a discussion going with a client, to actually find time on their calendar to actually discuss something with them. It might take another month, if the, you've got a match there, to get a proposal to the client. Maybe a two months more for them to make an evaluation of it, two more months for them to do a trial, a month till they place an order, and then it might take you two months to deliver. So in actual fact, from the time a lead starts until you get an installation and therefore can book revenue, it might be nine months in total in our example here. Now the problem is that would be nice if every lead turned into a sale, wouldn't it be? So the first thing you have to understand is the sales funnel and how long it takes at each stage. The second thing is what's the conversion rate at each stage? Because I'd love to have a situation where I could go and make 100, find 100 potential leads and then sell 100 uh, products. But does anybody here have experience with what percentage of leads actually turn into orders in their own experience? Well, less, than less than 50. Other people? 3%, something like that? 5%, you know, 5% is doing really well in my experience. Uh, typically, you start with a lead and, and you know, you've got a lot of people out there who need to be entertained. And one way of entertaining themselves is they go and call on potential suppliers and go talk to them. And they're, they're sitting in IT departments and they, they like learning about new stuff. And the way they get trained about new stuff is pretending that they're interested in that new stuff. So you get a really large drop-off rate from lead to discussion about 50%, let's say, in this example. 20% then move to a proposal. 10% move to an evaluation. 
5% to a trial, 4% to an order, 3%. So your total conversion on this is 3%. So let's go back and say, you know, we need to do $2 million of revenue, and there are, the average sale is $20,000. Now that should be 100 sales, am I correct? So if you have to do 100 sales, and it takes, um, you get a 3% conversion rate, then you've got to have something in the order of 3,000 leads to produce those 100 sales. Now, how many leads can an individual get? How many leads can a salesperson deal with? So another of the flaws that we get and we see all the time in these models is that, you know, there is no salesperson, there's a CEO, and the CEO spends half of her time developing the product and the other half trying to sell and not with much great experience. So if you'll break down the number of things that a CEO or a salesperson can do is even in the most experienced companies, a salesperson of, of enterprise software in large ticket items might be able to do $4 million a year. They probably can't do more than one order per month. And so understanding your conversion rate and its implications on your people is also another uh, subtle thing that you've got to do. So if you've gone through and you've figured out how many are there and how do I get to them, what's my sales funnel, what's the length of time to my sales funnel, and what's my conversion rate, you can now go and sit down with Excel. So it's sort of forbidden until you get to that point. And it's very simple. You build a very simple model. It's not difficult at all. And it just stretches the months out ad infinitum. And you block in how many leads you expect to get every month. And then from that, how many discussions, and you waterfall it. You waterfall it down. So I did that as an example. I was trying to model exactly the same market that we were discussing earlier. And when I mar modeled it, I had in the first year getting 156 leads and actually being able to increase that through extra activity to 500 leads a year. But because it takes so long and the dropout rate is so high, the first year actually had 0.3 of a sale. I mean, mathematically, you can create 0.3s of a sale. You know that doesn't happen in reality. But uh, mathematically, in year two, we had seven sales moving to 12 sales. So here it took 510 leads in the last year. But in year three, we're really just dealing with the leads that we got in year two. And in year two, we're selling to the people that we got as leads in year one. And that's the waterfall that you've got to create. Now, having created that waterfall, you've then got to look at some rules of thumb. And you know, understanding your industry again, which we keep coming back to, is essential in, in building these rules of thumb. So in marketing terms, uh, in, the, in successful software companies, let's say that they're spending a total of 35% on sales and marketing at, you know, when they're profitable. Then consider the fact that you might need to spend, let's say, 20% of that on sales and 15% on marketing. So you go out, find out about the other companies that are in your industry. Go look on Edgar, go look on uh, various sources that can look at their financial statements to say, what are they spending on sales? What are they spending on marketing? And start backing that into what you need to do. Figure that you will be a quarter as effective as they are, or maybe if you're really good, half as effective as they are, so that your marketing bucks are not going to drive the same reactions as theirs are. The other thing you've got to realize is that when you're doing this, you have to start from the very beginning. You have to start your sales and marketing long before you expect to get your results. Because if you don't, you're not generating the leads, the discussions, the proposals, the trials, the value, all of those things that are going to bring you uh, success. And this is where a lot of plans fail down, fall down. Because people are looking out and they're, they're not realizing the length of time, the conversion rate, or how many people it actually takes to produce the results that you want. So if you're in an industry where the average salesperson takes, does $2 million worth of sales, you should figure that your starting new salesperson might do half a million. And then with reference accounts, build eventually up to get to $2 million. When you look at the stats on the revenue per employee, of successful software companies, and I keep using software because it's, I really don't understand life sciences industry, and there are various people in the room that really know that I don't get that industry. Uh, if you look at software, you'll, you'll see that the very best companies do about $250,000 revenue per employee. And most of them are doing $100,000 revenue. And that's the effectiveness. 
your ability to do marketing well, to have all the right people on hand, to have a good value proposition. So that when you start doing the math with what your forecast is going to be, you have to back down from the levels of understanding your competitors to something that is quite realistic, something that is achievable. And you also, as I said before, you have to start from the very beginning, the very first day. So if you look at companies like Citrix out of the US, or some of the very big companies, they have phenomenal sales and marketing expenditures long before they have a product. What do Canadians do? They build it, and then they start selling it. So what's going to happen because of the long conversion rates if you're building it and then selling it? It's going to take you forever, isn't it? And you're going to end up in this valley of, you know, where are the results and why aren't the results coming? I've had a pro pro product for six months. Why isn't anybody ordering it? The very best companies in the U.S. are outselling the very minute they first conceive of a product. What are they selling that? What are they selling at that time? They're actually just finding out what the customer needs. They're communicating, they're entering in a dialogue with the customer, they identify the people who have the needs, and they use that information to develop better products. Which means that when the product's actually finished, what's the result? I worked with a company uh, in Thunder Bay, a very, very old, long-standing software company. And they were, you know, reasonable sales, they lost money every year, couldn't understand why. They didn't have a single salesperson. It's a very Canadian attitude, and I fell into this problem as well. The U.S. companies, on a per capita basis, have twice as many salespeople as the Canadian companies. They have six to seven times as much money to spend on sales and marketing as the Canadian companies, and they start minute one. They start selling the minute they start conceiving of a product. So when you look at your sales funnel and see what the impact that has on the sales funnel, that's what comes back to why U.S. companies can reach 10 million in six years, where it takes Canadian companies 10 years to reach that. Why U.S. companies are able to get to 50 million from time to time in six years when the Canadian companies can't even conceive of it. Because the ratcheting effect of managing your sales funnel has direct implications on your long-term results. Those are the rules of thumb, and once again, that's a marketing exercise that you need to know. You have to understand the process in the industry. The implications of all this. You've got to start with your top-down and then build your bottom-up. You have to compare your top-down approach to your bottom-up approach. Somehow, these two have to be in alignment. The ones that we created here were slightly misaligned, but not so badly misaligned that uh, it's a problem. The reason this, that you need to do both and compare them is that they both have different ways of looking at the marketplace. One is a, a very granular way of looking at the marketplace, and one is more based upon clients and customers and market size. And the two approaches can help you resolve difficulties that you might have in reaching the market. Another thing you've got to watch out for, and this sometimes happens in U.S. firms, is overheating the market. If you go out and are doing too much of your sales and marketing with the wrong things in mind, you're going to overheat the market in a way that is not going to, it's going to drive demand without you being able to fulfill the results. And you see that all the time in, uh, in companies that are launching products that really aren't ready for the market. They've been overhyped. And Northern Tel, uh, Nortel used to do something very interesting, is that six months before the launch of a product, they would all start talking about the product. What do you think happened to sales at Nortel in the six months after for that existing product? They fell to almost nothing. So th the timing of getting into the market has real implications on your revenue. In Nortel's case, what it would do is they would announce something, people would stop buying that minute. They'd wait six months to get the next thing. And Nortel would go, oh no, what do we do now? Okay, no, we don't have this revenue we expected. So they, the, the timing of these things and understanding how the sales funnel works and how to engage it is absolutely essential. And the last thing is, I've said it, and I can't stress it enough. Good companies start selling long before the product is ready. They understand the sales funnel, they understand what is necessary to get the product to the market, get out there. So what's next? Checking your assumptions. And this is something that many companies don't do. They produce forecasts, and they put them in a drawer, and next year they produce no forecasts, and they never look back to say, 
you know, what did I forecast and what were uh, the results? Tony Redpath told me an interesting story. Uh, in the ROB today, there is uh, predictions as to what will happen in the housing market. As you can imagine, because of my initial interest 30 years ago in the housing market, I still stay with this, what's going to happen to the housing market. So they're making predictions, but the paper had actually went back and looked at the last three years of predictions to say what was going to happen in the housing market. And the real estate board expected 2008 would be a banner year with lots of increase. And what actually happened? Market tanked. Well, because the market tanked in 2008, what did they expect of 2009? No, they expected it to be still low. And what happened in 2009? The market zoomed. So 2010, what did they say? We can't tell. I don't know. I give up. The key to successful forecasting is don't make it an annual event. Don't, don't spend your time saying, OK, you know, we made the forecast. We're done with it. You have to keep changing your forecast every time you get new information. So one of the things I did at Cynamics was I actually produced forecasts every single week. And you might think that that takes a lot of time. It actually doesn't. If you build your forecasts so that it flows from your sales funnel, all you have to do is change where someone is in the sales funnel, and it changes all your forecasts. So every week, we would have a sales meeting, and we would evaluate who was in the funnel and what stage they were at and how long it was taking. And we'd re-estimate for every company in the sales funnel where they were going to be uh, in 12 months' time. And that continually produced new forecasts. So we were able to produce Realistic forecasts every single week. It's no, you know, if you don't have sales meetings that often, you produce them monthly or something like that. But it's a valuable tool because that was one of the things that allowed us to be consistently growing and consistently profitable. Constantly checking your assumptions, constantly going back, checking your forecast monthly. Finally, for investors, what do you do with investors? So the problem is, no matter what you tell investors, they won't believe you. If you tell them that your revenue is going to be $2 million in three years, which is probably likely when you're starting out, they won't think that's good enough to bother investing. If you tell them it's going to be 20, they won't believe you. So I really don't know how to solve this problem. Having talked with all sorts of investors over the year, it, it, it is, it's like a game, and they're playing one half of the game, and you're playing one half of the game. So you approach it like a game. And if I were setting out right now, I'd probably aim for $10 million in six years and build a forecast that says that. When I went to raise money for Cynamics, uh, I looked at, um, we, this was the heady days of being able to raise money. Instead of figuring out how much we needed, I went and looked at the market to figure out how much people were investing. And I decided that an optimal, um, optimal amount to request was $10 million. So I built a forecast and a plan around getting $10 million so that it would appeal to the right people. We ended up raising $12 million for the company, but it was another aspect of knowing your investor and what the investor's needs were before you go to the investor. Be prepared to discuss your forecasts in detail. Don't sit there and you know, produce the forecast. We've seen this where people go out and hire a consultant, typically a CA who doesn't understand business, which is most of us. Most, they go out, they get somebody to do their forecast, the, the investor looks at them and says, so what's this mean? And the next reaction is, well, I don't know, I'll have to ask my accountant. You have to understand your forecasts intimately. You have to live them. You have to understand your market to understand your forecasts. No matter what you do, no one's going to believe you anyway. So you better be prepared to believe yourself. Believe in yourself. Believe that you've done a good job. Constantly reassess what you're doing in order to get these things perfect. And this is the art of forecasting. And the art of not creating hockey stick forecasts is that it's all about marketing. It's not about accounting. It's not about finance. It's not about the numbers. It's understanding your market. And fundamentally, if you understand your market, if you've done all your homework, you have a much better chance of doing realistic forecasts, which is why when you ask most accountants, and uh, Joanne told me another story about her, uh, the accountant in the firm that she was with before, just before this meeting, about the problems that this accountant had in producing forecasts. Well, the problem that most accountants have is that they're not marketers. They don't understand the markets. They can't communicate with the marketers, and the marketers don't understand forecasting. Forecasting is something that should be left to the marketers, not to the accountants. Because forecasting accurately is more about the art of marketing than it is about accounting or finance.
I finished in time so Carrie won't have a fit. If you have questions that you want to ask, you can come to the mic. Or if you're too bashful to uh, ask them at the mic, you can ask me later. Anyone? Charles, I do have a question. You said that the most successful US company go to the market with the product idea from minute one. Yep. And then a few minutes later, you said that the biggest mistake Nautilus did was they went to the market six months ahead and pre-announced a new product, and nobody buy and wait six months for the new product. So timing is key. So what is the right timing? I'm confused. Well, the difference there, and I'm sorry to confuse you. You're absolutely right. The difference is startup companies versus existing companies. Nortel is existing. So when they announce a product, everybody start, stops buying the ones that exist now. When a new company announces a product, there's no sales problem with that. They're communicating and finding out needs more effectively that way. I've got a uh, web startup and I'm trying to assess uh, my potential users. And I've started from the point of uh, world internet population, gone down to uh, my demographic, and then you know people who might become aware of the site and then people who might actually decide to visit the site um, and just sort of broke it down into, into a number. Um, I got a little bit of, um, I, I've been advised to go against that, but not advised to go with a particular um, assessment in uh, my potential users. So I, I wondered if you had a suggestion. When you say go against it, what do you mean? Like that, you know, starting with world internet population doesn't really make sense because I, I don't know. I, I, I've got advice that it's not uh, necessarily accurate. Um, but at the same time, I haven't gotten any advice as to like what to do instead. So. Uh, I'd probably have to ask more questions to get, yeah. uh, but ignore world internet population. Right. I would agree with that. Kay. I'd start with uh, understanding, for instance, if you're selling basketballs on the internet, understand how many people play basketball and how many teams there are and how many uh, basketballs a team buys a year and then go out to the whole world. So you've got to look at your particular niche because your product exists within a market niche of interest or problem or something like that. And you've got to find out not how many people are other in the internet, but how many people have the problem that you're trying to solve. Mm -hmm. Does that make more sense? Yeah, it helps. Thanks. Other questions? The, the early innovator problem, if you know you've got sales to a couple of early innovators and you know it's going to be a while, how is anyone expected, I mean it's sort of philosophical, how is anyone expected to live long enough <laughs> to, to get it or, I mean especially in Canada, if we can't get the investors to give us money in the first place to do marketing, is your solution to do more marketing at the... To well, deal with the only early inventor problem? You've asked 17 questions. Sorry, yeah. You know, it's okay. <laughs> but I'll, I'll warn you of one thing. I, Entrepreneurship 101, I'm doing a talk in April on, on uh, what's my topic? Bootstrapping. I, thank you for reminding me. Uh, there's a real art to that. Forget investors. Don't, people should not go get VCs. Figure out who's going to buy your, sell something similar to what you're doing and s sell something that they're currently buying so that you establish a relationship with them and then try and sell them the innovative thing that you're doing. Or find the innovators who are willing to pay early on for the production of that. And use those innovators then as reference accounts. The problem is, if you read Jeffrey Moore, is that there's a gap between the innovator, early adopter, et cetera, and they don't communicate very well because they buy for different reasons. You have to get people who buy for the value proposition that works in the total market not people who buy because they're interested or have a hobby. So that, the key is who you get early on in order to get um, into the market. So the question is, how accurate can you believe in research? It depends on the nature of the research. If you've done secondary research, it's probably not believable. If you've done primary research, which is actually going out and asking customers and targeting a specific population, and this is what's great of thing about the internet now, is that there are all sorts of marketing companies that actually uh, 
that have panels, and the panels might have two million people in them. So they're able to understand who is in their panel, segregate them by various types, and you say you're, you're trying to sell basketballs to basketball teams, they'll go out and do a survey people who play basketball because they know these people play basketball. So if you're doing that type of primary research, that's probably pretty valid. Um, if you're do using secondary research or more generalized um, primary research, it's probably not as valid. As long as it's not a life sciences comment. Mike? Mike? No, not Mike. That'll be a first. Because it's shocking, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, I just wanted to support your, your, your final slide as, as an investor and with the IAF that we don't expect a perfect forecast. Well, it's an exercise that we do, and it's a back and forth to see how well you understand your market and to have you help us understand your market. Because we know you're, not, you're, not, you're likely not going to hit the number. You may, you may knock it out of the ballpark. You may not come anywhere near it. But the whole purpose is to really go back and forth and, and to understand the assumptions you've made, the, um, the, uh, how big the market is, um, and how you're going to attack it. That's Great. all I had to say. Thanks. Now, biotech. Biotech, you know, be careful. careful, okay, I could be, be careful of what I say. I don't understand what they're talking about most of the time anyway. Just wanted to see if you can uh, speak a little bit about uh, valuation of the company and how we can go from projection to actually evaluate, evaluating the company and how you can use it as a support. Okay, your company is worth nothing, get over it. <laughs> <laughs> I know that for a fact. So, <laughs> it, it, <laughs> even better. It, it, it's a complex question. The problem is that and many, many years ago, people had realistic expectations of valuation. And so if you're doing $2 million worth of sales a year, the problem is no one's going to buy your company anyway. You, you don't get attention as a potential uh, a company, as a, you know, somebody that would be willing to buy you until you're about $10 million and you're starting to threaten some other company. So that below $10 million valuation is a game, more than anything else. And so because uh, VCs got forecasts that were phantasmagorical, and companies claimed valuations that were phantasmagorical, VCs invented mechanisms uh, that are liquidity preference ratios, all sorts of strange vehicles to make sure that they got all their money back first, and then they got a return on their money, and then they'd split the return with you. So that when you're, I wouldn't bother spending any time on valuation. And in fact, in any discussions I've had in raising money with, with uh, VCs, I've always said, you know, I don't care what the valuation is. You just tell me what the deal is and what I think I can do as a result of it. So don't, don't obsess. Good advice. Thanks. We uh, put together a forecast that shows about six million in year three, about eight million in year four, and about ten million in year five. And uh, the market that we were able to clearly define is about two point six billion. Yeah. So the complaint I'm getting from the in potential investors is, is why are you guys getting such a small percentage of the market? And uh, do you have any comments on? I got exactly. This art? I got exactly the same complaint from Arch Venture Partners in Chicago when I said the market is. X billion, we're going to do this amount. And their response is, well, you can't be any good if that's all you're going to get. The key is you've got to take them down from the idea that it's a $2 billion market to what it actually it is today. And that is taking the Gartner and Forrester and Frost and Sullivan and dissecting. Because, for instance, if they deal with educational training market, there is platforms, there's content, there's uh, live delivery. So you've got to segment those and then you've got to segment them by vertical that you're in and, and you start chopping that two billion dollars down, you'll get to a smaller market and your revenue will be, you know, 30, 40 percent of that smaller market. More believable. Yeah. Thanks. Come on up. What I would suggest to your, your uh, comment was, uh, uh, as Joan was saying, venture capitalists want to see uh, realistic projections. So you're showing a realistic projection, uh, mitigating risk, you know, conservative estimates. Uh, what I would suggest is, is you go a low, medium, high projection, and then you see what they're comfortable with. And uh, between you and I, I'd go to low, mitigate your, your risk, meet those numbers, milestones, and there's more money. So that's, that's my solution to your question. 
This is more of a thought than a question. I just want to see what you think about this. Um, we're, we're playing. I'm an accountant. I don't think. Well, whatever. Um, we're. We're innovating something that's pretty disruptive and doesn't have a current market. And most of the models you were discussing were things that have previous history. We can go look up a report or see what, what somebody else is doing. What are your thoughts on, on building a, a projection for something that is a disruptive technology? How do, how, do, how do I even begin to tackle that or think about it? So it depends on what you mean by disruptive, because if you get with... Something that does not exist in the market. Well, Clay, Clayton Christensen, for instance, says that the most disruptive things are when you take uh, a complex solution and simplify it, make it less expensive for a huge market that isn't currently being served. In that case, there is an existing market. So I, I've really yet to see something where I couldn't find a parallel or something else in the market. But the one way of doing it is look at what you displace. So look at the market for the thing that you displace, because you've got to be displacing something. And for instance, in database software, they're displacing the use of Excel. And you can find out how many people use Excel for a particular application or within a particular vertical, particular industry, et cetera. And you figure, OK, if, if what you're doing is totally disruptive, then you must be displacing something that exists nowadays, and you can go after that instead. Sorry, what about some of the issues around markets that are just literally just come into existence based on government regulation, like cap and trade, or some of these issues where there are no solutions in the marketplace and no established guidelines? And so that's the best thing you can be in. Okay, so the best market to be in is one where a regulation has created a market. The uh, Canadian government created the Canadian music industry with one act of parliament, mm -hmm. mandating that radio stations play Canadian content. Right. So that's a perfect example of something where you have no idea what the marketplace is. Nobody does. But nobody does. Yeah. So you've got to go back to the end user again. So if you, look at, uh, if you look at cap and trade and a variety of things like that, there's an unlimited market for um, wind turbines and solar farms at current uh, prices, isn't there? Mm -hmm. And in fact, in that, it's a different type of business because it's a capital intensive business and you're selling the result. You know that you're limited by the amount of capital and not by the amount of customers because the government is guaranteed to buy a certain amount. So it depends on the nature of the regulation. If the government's guaranteed to buy it, your projections are going to be quite simple because you know, you know you can raise $100 million and that's going to be able to produce X kilowatts of energy and that X kilowatts is going to sell for Y price. Okay, um, and when you're approaching venture capital to, to raise money for this sort of thing is it's less about that forecast really it's more about your product in the market and how you paint it, your it can be in, in the in the cases I just mentioned there probably aren't venture capitalists there'll be large institutional investors yeah. who will be buying that and they'll look at things they will do very very uh, complex sets of uh, calculations somewhat like building a building yeah. you you'll actually spend a phenomenal amount of time if you're building a building or building a uh, you know, energy generation plant of some sort in calculating the costs that go into that building. So you're going to spend less time on the revenue side and more time on your cost to, to build. So would you say it's better to engage directly quickly with those entities to build your forecasts? Well, you've got to engage with the people that are, that are actually going to build your building, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Those people you need to engage with right away. Okay. Prior to having a big sort of fancy yeah. top Yeah, because you've you got to know if, if it's yeah. doable. Okay. All right. Thank you. I can't believe the number of questions. Our company invested a lot on cold calling and trade show, and usually, actually, the turned out rate per the lead is 3%, 2 to 3%. The thing is, we identify the actual practical way, identify our target market and everything, but there's another hurdle, knowing how much will be the wallet share associated to that particular account, right? The thing, and another one, We've been talking with our marketing people how much will be their forecast. Sometimes they set the forecast too low that it will, it's no longer viable for the company to exist. What I did, I simply do the historical data using a regression analysis to predict what, will be the, what the future will hold. The thing is, sometimes if you keep on fighting with the salespeople, they said, they said, certain data, maybe using regression analysis, using historical data, is not a good indicator of what will happen in the future. Any comment? Yes, they know their math. 
The first rule of regression analysis is it is not a future predictor. It just fits a line to a, or fits a curve to a set of data. So you can't use regression analysis to predict the future. Uh, now that's a big problem. <laughs> <laughs> and I wish in several cases I'd known that ahead of time. <laughs> that, uh, you know, you've got a, you've, there's a new trend in the world. It's called fact-based management. Now just think about that for a second. Before there was fact-based management, what kind of management was that? It's sort of like there is a new trend in medicine called evidence-based medicine. <laughs> okay, what you've got is you've got to fight facts with facts. So if they're taking down your facts, you've got to build up and make facts your, your friend. Yeah, it so happened that we identified pieces and then we everything, right? We identified the market, the specific account because of the conversion of the leads. Yeah. The thing is, what they don't know actually in these settings, I don't know how much will be the wallet share to the specific account. Yeah. That's and how much each, well, you can actually ask them. But I'm working with an entrepreneur. I've been working with an entrepreneur now who brought me the question, how much should I charge? And I said, ask your prospects. Engage in a discussion. Find out what it's worth to them. Find out how much value there is. Use that to build your, your price. You know, the thing is, sometimes a customer can promise you anything, right? Sometimes it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily convert them into action or Yeah, I've, I've actually had good experience when I've asked customers. They tell me reality. It's, I guess it might be the way you ask them or something. It's 1.15. Do you want to? End it and people can come and ask me questions afterwards.